Okay. Yes, sir. All right, we're live. Right. Yeah. Hello, and welcome to the Purdue Basketball Beat. It's been quite a long time since our last podcast. Here with me is Anish, and we just got a text from Andy like two seconds ago with a last-minute cancel. Never reliable, that man. I mean, I'm just saying. Never, never. It's hurtful. It's, I'm not mad. I'm hurt. I'm mad. I'm mad. I'm, you be mad. I'm hurt. My feelings are hurt. They're going to have to sit here and have a talk. <laughs> Dear Andy, when you cancel on me at the last second, it makes me feel like you don't value me. You sound like a D'Angelo album. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what I'll listen to. I'll turn off all the lights, put on D'Angelo, and just have a good cry. Did you listen to the new one? He, I mean, that was really good, man. It took him long enough. Yeah, I know. I mean, he was working on it for, like, what, 20 years? He's like... Like him and Tool. That's the one thing that those two <laughs> artists have in common. They each take eight years to make an album. What's the uh, Chinese democracy joke? Is that Guns N' Roses? Yeah, that's Guns N' Roses. Okay. Except when D'Angelo and Tool make an album every eight years, it's usually pretty awesome. <laughs> when Chinese democracy was like watching a dog take a shit. <laughs> Man, shout out to Axl Rose and uh, his cornrows. Shout out to Fat Axl, by the way. I love it. Like, like way to just not care anymore. You know? No, he, he's really committed to, to his look, to his, to his entire shtick. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, more power to him, I guess. Well, the question is, is he fat because he's on drugs or fat because he's no longer on drugs? <laughs> so and so is he is he uh oh man i was about to say is he elvis fett or is he jared vogel fett but i think ooh, say, ooh. i think i think yeah. <laughs> let's not go there bad timing for the vogel <laughs> i'm sorry it's been a rough week for jared no comment on the vogel no comment on the vogel no comment shout out indiana shout out shout to Zinesville. yeah no uh I think Axel, I think his fatness means that he stopped doing cocaine and started smoking pot again. Or good. More. I mean, good. I, you, I think that's the, that's the preferable state, right? Like if you were so. to choose. If, if you were to choose booze and pot over a Coke and whatever else he was doing back in the days. Yeah, I guess, I guess booze and pot isn't too far from my existence, but <laughs> <laughs> that's a joke. That's a joke, that's people. Joke. That, that joke will not make the final. <laughs> I can't guarantee I will cut it. But <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of people whose hair I am uh, completely jealous of, mm-hmm. Caleb Swanigan. Of course. Yeah. Now, wait, me- okay, wait, wait, wait. Let's let's just do an outline here because I'll I'll write this on the um on the interweb. So what we're planning on doing is about like 20, 25 minutes of uh, Swanigan. We'll do Team USA. Um, and a uh, little preview of next year, but we'll, we'll try to keep it just Team USA focused. Maybe do um, some Vince Edwards and, and Isaac Haas doing Team USA related things. Um, we'll do a podcast with you if we somehow didn't talk about Vince Edwards. That's right. That's right. Um, but then we will transition into NBA and oh. we'll do like 10 minutes of like general NBA thoughts because I feel like we're both NBA fans and yeah. the rest of Boiled Sports is. I can't really speak to Andy. I think he's an NBA fan just generally. But, but the the yeah, Dowd and Justin are just not really. You know, now we should probably just publish our email thread. Well, a heavily edited version of our email thread. <laughs> That's right. So Dowd is staunchly anti. I am he's staunchly, staunchly for. Yeah. And like I feel like you and 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 uh, and Jay are like the middle, like you know you, you're the you know conservative liberal and he's the liberal conservative. You know what I mean? Like you're kind of like in the middle, leaning one way or another. So like, I'm just, actually like pretty hardcore, but I keep it under wraps a little. Okay, bit. I can't. I have no. I have no under wraps power. But uh, I'm just, super negative when it comes to the pace. We'll get it. We'll get okay, it. Yeah, we'll get into it anyway. Swanigan, talk about Caleb Swanigan's haircut by the way <laughs> let me let me just say uh this will mark the second time that we've discussed caleb's fashion choices on our podcast i don't i think it was on twitter last time was it or, on twitter? Like, or like on emails or something like that like i think it was before he committed if you look yeah, uh, on youtube that, yeah. there's like there's like an interview with him and yeah. he's in this like sharp v-neck like yeah. it'd be a crew neck but yeah. it's the v it's like a sharp v so no chest none of that classiness classlessness 
Right. Um, and then he had the man bun. The like man he bun. Had, he had his blowout, like, you know, his vertical blowout that he usually does for the games, but he had it in a man bun and he had these like sophisticated glasses. And I was like, this is a young man's going to run for president one day. He looked, I would have voted for him. He, he's amazing. amazing. Uh, he looks on the court. This might be an obscure reference. He looks like Captain Kirk from oh. The Roots. Right. Like the dude who plays the guitar in The Roots, yeah. like with the hair. You should yeah. watch them do uh, a Beastie Boys song. I think it's Sabotage. And he's tremendous and he looks like a psychopath. And it makes me think of Caleb Swanigan on the court. It's amazing. Except this dude weighs maybe 150 pounds. And Caleb Swanigan's left uh, <clears throat> shoulder weighs mm-hmm. 150 pounds. Very true. Yes. No, but I do appreciate the blowout. I, it's it's fantastic. It's a great look. Fashionable. Um, <laughs> if you go to Team Unfashionable. If you, if you go to Team USA's the under nineteen page and they have like each of the pictures of everyone on there. Swanigan's got like these the blowout, like just in full form, mutton chops and the uh the chin, the chin hair, the chin goatee. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing. Ten out of ten. I love it. I, I, I'm with you. It's a good look. Everybody else here, like everybody else, kind of look. Actually, no, the blowout's coming back into style. Like every, like all the Duke kids had it. Mm-hmm. Um, like oh, Oka Ford. Justice Winslow's look, right? Yeah, I, I, I'm digging Justice Winslow's look. Yeah, uh, he almost fell to the Pacers anyway. So yeah, let's just let's move <laughs> on. But Swanee looked really good. Like in the in everything until the championship game, he looked really good. And he had like a you know on on a roster full of some of the most talented, I think maybe the most talented under 19 roster um, that the USA has ever has had in a while. Yeah. Um, like, and it looks like what the 2016 draft cl- or 2017 draft class is going to be just stacked. Um, I mean, he, he held his own and he was one of the, you know, one of the people who stood out on there. what do you think? You saw a little more um, of the, um, of the tournament that I did. So what'd you think? I don't, you know, from a scoring perspective, he, he, I don't think he really stood out as much. I think he, you know, he, he had, um, he played pretty good defense and he did a decent job um, rebounding. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, he was, um, I think his minutes were much more, um, varied than i was expecting yeah and they were controlled too so if you look at it he was middle of the pack and um his his totals or his averages were around on you know uh, just basically the middle um of everybody on the team but his minutes were significantly lower than you know the top half so i think his you know if you were to do a per 40 or per 36 his minute his his stats would be great but i just think um especially in the championship against uh against croatia yeah. Um, see, that's that's one of the concerns I have is that against Croatia, they were going small ball. They were going four out, um, four and a half out. Basically, their center was almost, you know, floating on the perimeter, too. So that kind of rendered Swanigan a little bit obsolete, which is what I'm afraid of, is that we're doubling down on size um, when at least at the NBA level, um, it looks like it's trending towards, um, you know, having four, like at least four out um, and then one in. See, I think I think uh, that's less of an issue at the college level because I think you're right. College teams don't have the skill to really hurt you with small ball. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, in the NBA, everyone can shoot, right? Everyone can do three things, right? Do three things. Mm-hmm. And in college, like there are teams that have starters that can't really even do one thing. So, um, doubling down on size is okay, especially if. Swanigan continues to um, improve his mid-range game, mm-hmm. which is another thing that's leaving the NBA game, but for reasons that are statistically significant, right? Like an NBA player can hit a three-pointer as just as easy as they can hit. Yeah, I mean, it's but, just you get you get skilled. You're you're literally taking the best. Um, you know, 10% of the 400 players in the NCAA every year, putting them in the NBA and, yeah. you know, what percentage of those actually make it, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I think 
you the skill level once you get to the NBA is really high. But yeah, the, I mean, the mid range is going to be pretty important in college, especially facilitating for Purdue. Like you know, we're not really pro, we're, odds are we're not going to have a pure point guard on the floor at all times. In fact, I think we'll like have more lineups without a pure point guard than we will with. Um, so Swanigan Edwards. Uh, Davis, those kind of players who can facilitate, um, but not necessarily be, you know, quote point guard, um, are incredibly important. I think I think that's where he he was um, shining a little bit, and also he played a little closer to the basket in uh, Team USA than um, than I think we're expecting him to play alongside Haas and Hammonds. Um, and that's just because of necessity. There really isn't another. Um, there, I think uh, Onuaku was another um, right. like low post threat, but really there there weren't. It was mostly um, wings. Also, G- Harry Giles, man, that kid is going to be a stud when he gets to when he gets to the pros. He's like six ten wing, yeah. um, just unbelievable. But yeah, like most of it is like perimeter um, perimeter talent. So. That's the other thing is um, guys at Golden Black were talking about it too, was that he adapts really well. Like he adapts to any situation really well. He's, you know, he may or may not be the most uh, talented and the centerpiece of every team like this team USA team, but he always does like whatever is necessary and his teams always win. Yeah. Um, So I, I mean, that's coming into a team that is a little bit, established i don't know how established we can say but you know coming into a team that has chemistry that has a flow to it i think that's kind of a good omen is that he can fit in really well um you know wherever he is and he's going to be featured more at purdue so you would think that he's um gonna thrive a little bit well and established i don't don't know about established but but maybe um um there's not going to be a ton of pressure on him to produce Mm -hmm a lot from day one. I mean, he'll start from day one. He'll probably start every game, but no one is counting on him being the leading scorer or anything. You know, he's just got to – they'll run the offense through him, and um, Mm -hmm. there's not going to be, like, a lot of pressure for him to put up, like, 15 and 10 every game. So that gives him a chance to polish some of his away from the basket skills that he already has a good start on. So, And I I think he's – his footwork is so good. Um, his footwork, his ball handling is already so good that, and his stroke looks great. That, He's um, a great passer. Oh yeah, I mean, just really smart, a really smart player. Like, and you, and you don't usually see that coming out of coming out of high school, and that that's probably his his biggest you know attribute is that you know his his adaptability and his high IQ he, like uncommonly high basketball IQ even compared to other people on the team USA team well in in his work ethic and that's a part of working with Barnes yeah. for the last three years but you know his he's the his fellow USA basketball teammates were talking about how he was a beast yeah so, now and this was a thing that you know he I think, you know, you can kind of enjoy the trip if you wanted to, you know? Yeah, I'm, oh, and I think there were concerns coming into, you know, his senior year of, of you know, his work ethic. I mean, and it, it's going to be there when a kid is 6'9 and 350. Um, there's going to be, you know, there's going to be concerns about work ethic based on, you know, do you want to lose weight? Do you want to get in shape? Will you, you know, be in shape? by the time you know or to to play along with other the other um you know high level talent some of the highest level talent um in the world at in your age bracket and you know golden black did another really great um spotlight of both his teammates and his train his coaches his trainers mm-hmm. um you know, his teammates seem to be just enjoying greece and stuff like you know going seeing stuff i mean you're in freaking you're a 17 year old or an 18 year old in greece like right. that's awesome um but apparently like every night like all swanigan was doing whenever they had any time off was training mm-hmm. um you know, with the trainer and and that's uh super exciting that's awesome <laughs> I'm so excited. He's gonna be good. Yeah, he, this. I, I mean, I look forward to at least two years of him. I don't. I man, I'm gonna 
get I'm get, gonna get bit in the ass for this one, but just based on everything we see, it's so hard to see him have a low floor. You know, like it's so hard to see him bust. Like he might not be as great as we're hoping that he is, even after two years. Uh-huh. Um, like you know, he might pan out to be a late first rounder, early second rounder, whatever. Um, but it's really hard for me to see a situation where he's just like a non-injury situation um, where he's just like a failure, like abject, like Josh Selby type number one player in the country, but like flames out type failure. Josh Selby. They were running. I think uh, CBS sports did a re-ranking of the 2010 class and like Kyrie was there and a bunch of talent was there. And I was like, who's, who's the number one in the, and Josh Selby. Shout yeah. out to Josh Selby. Shout out to Josh Shelby. He's in uh, Israel, apparently. Wow. Is that real? Not... Oh, man. I know. Two years in Memphis, and then it was D-League, 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 China, Croatia, man. Israel. Mm. It's crazy. And he was the Big Ten freshman of the year, apparently. Dang. So the light cool. comes at you fast, man. No kidding. Uh, uh, Jalen Brunson. Uh, going to Villanova, he said he can do anything you ask. Oh, Swan again. He said he can do anything you ask him to. He can get a bucket at any time in the low post. No one is physically able to box him out. The sky's the limit for Caleb. Um, Harry Giles, who is the best team or the best player on the team, probably would be the number one pick in 2017 in a stacked 2017 class. Uh, yeah. He's a beast. He's a bully, a steel bully. Um, <laughs> like, it just looks like he, you know, Hammonds took two years to learn how to use his size, really, and learn how to bully people inside. And you can argue he didn't really take advantage of that until Big Ten season this year. So two and a half years into his career, it looks like Swanigan has no problem, you know, being a beast inside. And he's got touch, you know, on the outside. Things I'm concerned with is that, you know, his his, mo- his side-to-side mobility – um, in the little bit I watched um, of the, I watched most like 90% of the semifinal game. Um, and then uh, while he was in the Croatia game, man, wow. um, it, <laughs> it just looked like against some of these faster lineups, some of these quicker lineups, he really struggled to stay in front of his defender. Um, his length helps. I mean, his length helps on defense, but you know, it's still an immediate concern, you know, especially if we're going to play man and switch on everything, if we're going to continue to switch on everything to see if he can, you know, stay with perimeter players that are a little quicker. You know, he just has to, if we switch everything, he just has to not do. So, Tra- Tra- I mean, love Travis Carroll. But he was terrible at the at defending the pick and roll. Mm-hmm. You know, because he didn't have he didn't have any sort of quickness and would always get behind and would either get burnt on the dump or blown by. Yeah. So as long as Swanigan can use his length and his footwork to you know prevent a matador esque cut to the basket. Yeah. Then I think it'll be fine, especially when he's got Haas and Hammonds backing him. So that, you know, that's one, the he, biggest thing. Yeah. Colander out there. Right? <laughs> yeah, that I mean that's the biggest thing is having someone like Hammonds behind him. Um that's the biggest thing for anybody is that you know you can be super aggressive when you have AJ Hammonds behind you. You don't really have to worry. Um but you know we'll see. He's a he's a freshman. He's gonna have things that he's gonna need to improve on. I don't think he's ever gonna be quick. Like I don't think we'll ever be describing you know him first based on his quickness. It's gonna be his skill and his strength. Um but you know, the and his footwork and if he can you know, if he can leverage all that and what's he's got a seven one, seven two wingspan, you yeah. know, being, you know, six ten on stilts, you know, it's six ten in really tall platform shoes. <laughs> uh, what, what, what they Tom Cruise lifts. <laughs> they listed uh both him and uh Edwards at six nine, I thought. Yeah, Edwards isn't six nine. Yeah, that I mean that was weird, but then is does that mean Swanigan's not six? Nine? You know what I mean. Like, does that mean Swanigan is as tall as Edwards? So I've know, always heard six, Swanigan six. was a hair under six nine. Yeah, and Edwards was a hair under six eight. But I, you know, 
That could maybe he grew, you know. Maybe now that would be and great. By the time he, by the time Vince graduates, he's going to be like the seven foot freak of nature. All right, calm down. <laughs> moving on to the NBA. <laughs> well, so the other two things are Haas um, is doing like the eight. I think it's the eighteen team, yeah. um, or not eighteen, but he's doing the other. Um, I feel like it's the B squad, but like it's the other, like the not um like highest level of competition like this is the highest level um world championship team um he's doing like the FIBA equivalent Haas mm-hmm. is trying out for yeah. um, and he's getting he's getting pretty good um pretty good uh feedback from it I thought and it's always good to have exposure you know international exposure and exposure with other like super talented people um like super talented peers right um, yeah well especially when you can go up against um folks that are just as tall as he is and yeah. I mean he's he's competing against pro players mm-hmm. I mean, Ryan Hollins right from the Kings yeah so it's always good Pan American games that's it yeah. so and uh, Vince Edwards tried out for this team the the team that Swanigan was on the world championships and it looked like he made every cut except the last one and yeah for that for a player like Edwards who's not the most skilled who's not the most talented not the most athletic um for him to make it that far like even you know even I was surprised like I I thought he'd be out here he was kind of a you know painter helps out with the team so let's get his guys an extra tryout right but from everything that it sounded like like he was hitting every shot from the perimeter um, he just wasn't, you know, on par with some of these number one pick, like, you know, top 10, 2017 guys. Um, well, like you said that, you know, the forward positions are pretty crowded. Yeah. So. And so, but it's, it's, it's great to see that, you know, three cornerstones of this team are getting international experience and three not Hammonds or Davis. Yeah. Cause I'm, I don't think either one of us is concerned with Hammonds or Davis, right. but you know, the other three who could be, you know, or who will be in large, like getting large chunks of the minutes. Um, it's great to see them, you know, get, get that kind of stuff. So it's awesome. Like team USA has definitely been good. Uh, and this summer has definitely been a good summer for Purdue. Yes, absolutely. Can't this experience definitely helps. You know who this summer hasn't been good for? Who is that, Anish? The Indiana Pacers. Oh, I disagree with you there, <laughs> but let's continue. All right. So uh, you can probably turn off the uh, podcast if you're not an NBA fan uh, right now, but give it a chance if you're not. Like, it's fun. It's super fun. We're talking to you, Dad. <laughs> anyway, we'll get the whole subscribe on iTunes, all that. Uh, 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 the Pacers did not. But non all year, I can remember um, for for any like Pacers team. So like last February, they were the best team in the league, and then everything collapsed. And then Lance Stevenson left, and then Paul George broke his leg, and mm-hmm. then uh, George Hill got injured, and then David West left, and Roy Hibbert was traded. So yeah. You know, I I don't think it's that bad because I don't know. So Greg Doyle in the Star either was either Monday or Tuesday said that he thought that the ceiling for this Pacers team was the fourth seed in the West. That's insane. Which I think is insane. And I think, in fact, <laughs> in fact, I know that people are going to disagree with me. And if certain people on Twitter are listening to this, I know I'm going to get some hateful tweets about it. But I don't think this is a playoff team. And I don't think I don't think it was a playoff team with Hibbert and West either. So I think with I think with Hibbert and West and like even seventy percent of Paul George, um, I think it was a playoff team, but it was like the sixth seed. Um because okay, you scroll through the east, barring any injuries, which you have to do, it's Cavs, Bulls, um, Hawks, uh, Wizards, Raptors yeah. are pretty much a lock. I'd put the Bucks as a lock, you know, getting Greg Monroe. Um, getting Greg Monroe, like stealing him from the Lakers and the, and, uh, the, the Knicks, like that's crazy. Um, but that's six teams that are pretty much like inked in the playoffs. Oh, and the heat, 
I mean, like if the Heat stay healthy, I think their starting five is be- almost better than any. Like they have depth issues and health issues, but their starting five is almost better than anybody else in the league, or than you know any of the second tier teams of the league. Um, and they got friggin' Justice Winslow because Pat Riley gets everything. Right. But that's six to seven locks for the playoffs. And that eight seed is going to be fought for again by the Celtics, the Nets, the Pacers, um, the Pistons will be better. The magic will be better. Um, I think the magic are going to make a jump this year. I bought uh, Orlando magic stock when uh, what's his name for my, you Oladipo was drafted. I was like, that's going to be a fun tip with Vucevic and Oladipo. Yeah. And then now they got Peyton and Aaron Gordon, and uh, I love Mario Hazonia. I don't know how much international stuff you follow, but that dude is the gunneriest gunner like ever. He and is. He is uh, J.R. Smith, the Croatian J.R. Smith. He's incredible, but I think they're going to be pretty good and like push for maybe thirty-five, um, thirty-five wins, and if they even over like overshoot that a little bit, they're in the playoff hunt. I mean, that's how bad the East is. Um, so I think all those teams are better than the Pacers right now. I, I mean, like that's that's pretty, that's pretty much not really too much of a question. Also, Celtics just grabbed David Lee, and I think the internet has kind of overcorrected too much, you know, on David Lee. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he's a super skilled offensive player, and he can get you buckets. And he's not a good defensive player, and he doesn't, shoot threes so obviously the analytics movement hates him but i think like with brad stevens and with what he got out of that craptastic celtics squad i i think that's you know a borderline playoff team again so i don't know i think this pacers team is going to be really bad like really bad and i think that miles turner is not going to produce a ton in his rookie year i think he's a project a long-term guy if you know, if he becomes something, we'll see. So you know. I'm really trying not to get super excited based on summer league. Like summer league is well, glorified oh open gym. God. Don't even like but summer league. Come it's on. yeah. I'm an I'm a junkie man. <laughs> I have but summer yeah, league. Summer league means nothing. It means less than nothing. It's. I, if you can be a center that can that can protect the rim and shoot threes. Like there aren't like I can't you can't count like five of those in the league right now, um, and I I agree with you I don't think I wasn't excited when the Pacers drafted him, um, but now I th- I'm pretty okay especially like considering the other options that were available to him I mean Trey Lyles Cameron Payne um, Kelly Oubre Trey, you know um, Devin Booker like those are the other guys in that range. And I was like, miles Turner is the best out of those, uh, you know, of those options. And he gives you the option of trading Roy, but that's the thing. Like Hibbert was traded for basically the right to overpay Rodney Stuckey and a second round pick, you know, and maybe we'll get like Nick young out of it or oh, swaggy P I know, or like Jordan Hill or, you know, Ryan Kelly or some other garbage power forward. So I, you know, I think that this Pacers team is, it's frustrating because, it, but it's another, it's another rebuild, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, do you want to, you want to compete for the sixth seed in the East, or do you want to try to put together a championship caliber team? Well, and this kind of transitions into the whole impetus for this podcast between us. Larry does not believe in rebuilding any other way. This is how Larry rebuilds. Like, if you remember the 08 Pacers with Travis Diener, shout out to Travis Diener, wherever he is. He, like, they made the six, seven, eight, nine seed for like four or five years, like with Danny Granger and a bunch of trash. And then slowly stockpile, like, kept hitting in the draft. And that's how they got this team. Um, Oh, I forgot we traded Danny Granger, too. That was another trash move. Uh, nah, he was, he was done. Yeah, but for yeah, Evan Turner, you, it's just like the David Lee move that the Warriors did not make this summer, like, or did not make this trade deadline. They could have traded it, like, by the time February rolled around, Draymond Green had already taken the place in the starting lineup, but 
if you traded Draymond or if you traded David Lee in the middle of the season, the chemistry changes and you're already like the sum is greater than the parts, right? Yeah. Or whatever that saying is. Um, and it's Larry got overconfident, which is Larry, and messed with the chemistry and brought in freaking Evan Turner. Well, so that was 2014, right? Was that 20? Yeah, no, no, yeah. Like, that's what I'm talking Like, from... Oh, you're talking about from the from yeah. the heights of where this team was to the... Yeah, from the Pacers and the Blazers being the two best, like, you know, units in the league to now yeah, both teams are rebuilding. The Blazers right now. I know. It's super we sad. In a steaming pile of garbage. Well, they both they both have borderline superstars. I, I don't think... Lillard is a superstar, but I think he's very good. And I'm not convinced Paul comes back at the superstar level that he was, like after shattering his leg in half. I mean, I think that's a wait and see. He's definitely not going to be scoring, you know, averaging 30 points through yeah. the first half of this next season. I mean, it's going to take some time. And the the problem is the 2016 draft class looks to be bad. Like, I mean, looks to be um, like pretty, pretty bad. Uh, when, yeah, especially when you get I mean, this this was the class, right? Yeah, or this or 2017. Like the these are or last year. Like the, those three um, were are like were and are supposed to be um, some great like lottery stack teams, but or lottery stack like lineups. But next year is supposed to be um, kind of weak, and that that might be why Hammonds came back, right? I mean, like if Hammonds has a good year. Like maybe you take the proven, you know, seven footer you know, early in the second round if you can. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it that calculus kind of made sense to me. Whereas, you know, if you look at the last pick in the first round um, this year, like the last picks were like R.J. Hunter, Kavon Looney, like these these kids can play. Man, so, like I'm a huge R.J. Hunter fan. Yeah, I, 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 I look I think, at him and I see Kyle Korver. Right? He's He's so good. With more swag. Like, he's gone to Brad Stevens, who knew him since he was a kid. So, R.J. Hunter's dad, the Georgia State coach, used to be IUPUI's coach for, like, 20 years. Yep. And he coached George Hill. Yep. And, you know, R.J. Hunter, what, growing up in Indianapolis, was either was going to go to IUPUI until, you know, his dad left IUPUI and went to Georgia State, and he followed his dad. But Brad Stevens was like, whenever you get sick of your dad – you know, Butler's waiting for you. Right. Um, so I think, you know, that's a perfect fit. And so, you know what I mean? Like, there was no chance that AJ was going in the first round this year. Um, right. It was doubtful that he would go in the, you know, the second round, first half of the second round either. Um, so I think next year, because it's a weaker draft, um, you'll see his stock rise a little bit. But, yeah, I I don't like this Pacers rebuild. Like, it's not a good i don't like like i would rather tank like i would rather just tank it out and not make the playoffs like basically the opposite of what the celtics did this year so the <laughs> celtics got the the celtics like fought to make the playoffs and were swept unceremoniously by lebron right, right. um and their reward for that was the 16th pick instead of uh the 10th right and given hindsight, Justice Winslow fell to the 10th pick. Right. And the Celtics were the ones trying to trade six draft picks yes. to Charlotte to grab Justice Winslow. Like, for, Yeah, for the number nine pick, yep. So was that playoff experience with players who probably won't be on your team when it's going to be good, like, is that playoff experience worth it? I don't think so. Yeah. Um, like, as opposed to getting Justice Winslow and pairing him with Marcus Smart and um, and Isaiah Thomas and all these, you know, all of those guys that they have that are good, and Winslow could be the star. It's like, come on. Like, I I would rather, like, if if there's no hope in this, like, if there's no hope in competing for a title or even I competing for a title is stupid like competing for a conference you know uh championship berth i'd say tank but you can't even tank next year because it's trash i think the pacers are in a rough spot now the good thing about the pacers is that they don't have a ton of money allocated over the next couple of years but that kind of that, that doesn't really help them too much because the cap is going to explode right Yeah, everybody's going to have money next year everyone's going to have money 
and it's going to be and a lot of the sort of second tier stars have been locked up are taken, you know, even like Kevin Love signed like a four year or a three year with the with the player option oh. deal type of type of just, or maybe it was a four year with the fifth player option. I think it was four with a five, four plus one. Like Milwaukee had the right idea is that Milwaukee's not gonna get any, you know, big time free agents in twenty sixteen. Right. So they might as well throw a max offer yeah. at somebody and leverage the fact that Jason Kidd is a good coach. Uh, somehow, like improbably, Jason mm-hmm. Kidd is a good coach. Um, that team is really young, really promising, and in the East, which means that it's guaranteed a playoff spot. You know, right. and you might as well get your guy this summer instead of having to compete with everybody in the NBA next year. Who's gonna a, have max, cap space. A, a max contract now turns into a very manageable contract in two years. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, no, I think the Pacers are in kind of a rough spot, and and. and uh, this whole Paul George at the four thing is a really bad, especially after coming off of a shattered leg. Like it's a really bad idea. Oh man. I love him at the three. Cause he's such a huge mismatch against, you know, every other three in the league. For the that's, a, that's why I really like the Monte Ellis signing. I mean like Monte, first of all, Monte for $11 million um, okay. in the current market, a steal, like an absolute steal. Yeah. He can't play defense. But or he can't play like ultra defense. But George Hill is one of the best point guard defenders, like or guard defenders out there. So you put George on the point guard, you put Paul George George Hill at the point guard, you put Paul George at the other talented wing, and you can hide Monte Ellis, who's a good enough team defender. Like he can stay in front of people and whatever. Right. Um, but then giving seven to seven for guaranteeing three years. Um, to Rodney Stuckey, who's basically a worse version of Monte Ellis. Like, I don't, I don't get that. Um, we got CJ Miles already. Like, we didn't spend on the front court either. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's. I think it's. I think we're in for a rough couple of years. It'll be, and that what kills me about it is, I think it's gonna. We're gonna we're gonna just burn right through Paul George's prime. Exactly like Danny Granger. Yes. Exactly. You know, and I was having, you know, somebody asked me tonight um, whether I would mind or I wouldn't mind an Amari signing, um, you know, like just do a two year deal or whatever. Wait, um, or a one. Yeah. So, so I don't, no. I have such a soft spot for Amari <laughs> that maybe that's clouding it, but no, 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 no. Amari Stoudemire. Yeah, Dude, 25 minutes a game. Or like, how much are you going to give him? Four like, million? Like six. We'll probably have to give him a little more than he's worth. That's the problem. Is that he'll go, to, he'll go to someone like Houston for cheap, but he won't come to Indianapolis for cheap. Like, you know, he's coming to Indy, and he's going to demand a starting position and, you know, right. a decent amount of money. So he, he, that's I think, he's, I think he's a broken toy. I don't know if you want to commit any sort of. I mean, you're filling out a roster, maybe. But what is what does he give you? His knees are gone. Basically. He gives you scoring. He gives you somebody who can actually like legitimately bang in the post, as opposed to Paul. What is what you know compared to Paul? I think you know Mari's a better option. You re-sign Scola for cheap, and then we have Jan. We have uh, Damo Rudej, who's a legitimate stretch four if he can make three pointers right yeah. um you you have miles turner you can bring miles turner up a little you know slower the, and problem, with, the problem with a guy like stoudemire is that he still thinks that he is all-star yeah yeah and yeah. And he, yeah the role for him would be come in four or five million hold down the starting spot or like be be the guy that helps bring a guy like Turner along a little bit, and he, he's not interested in that. I don't think he's a. I don't mean that to say that he's a selfish player. I just, no, know, yeah, I know. I mean, his abilities that he's like, no, I yeah, I've I've got knee problems, but I'm okay. I'm gonna go out. 
I'm still a, a 20 and 10 potential guy. I, I can't, can't blame him. He was on top of the world for how many years, you know, like he was, he was one of the three best players in the, in the league for, you know, maybe two years there when he was playing with, uh, when he was playing with the Suns, like playing with Nash, right? Yeah. Um, like one of the three to five best players in the league. Like I think him and Nash were like uh, what Blake and Deion or Blake and, uh, and Chris Paul were, are now. Um, so, you know, it's, yeah, I don't know. I just don't see any other option. Like we bring back Scola, like Scola is almost certainly coming back. Um, and I don't know if I'm, you know, if I'm happy or like depressed making that statement. Um, like <laughs> Jordan Hill. Is if he and Ellis are out on the court at the same time, you've got two non-defenders. Yep. And Jan is a good Jan will be a good rim protector. Paul George and George Hill will be great on the perimeter. But yeah, it's like, you know, everybody's committed to this new style that we've never seen play, right? Like we did, the Pacers didn't even experiment running fast at all. Like, so we've never seen this. So I don't know how they're expecting it to work or whatever. I don't know if Vogel is a up-tempo kind of coach either. He's not an offensive coach. Like he, he should have hired like Melvin Hunt, someone right. like him. Like brought on an assistant instead of Popeye Jones and his weird ears, like <laughs> not doing anything on the bench. I, it's him and Nate McMillan, um, or uh, Vogel and Nate McMillan are on the bench, like crafting the defense and doing stuff like that. But they can't coach offense. Like I mean, I, it's it's pretty obvious right now. I'm thinking of. Thibodeau when I think of Vogel from a sk- skills as a coach standpoint. Yeah, I agree. And I, I would actually rather have Frank cause he's got interpersonal skills and like, you know, motivation and, you know, humanness. Right. And not um, everyone who encounters him hates him. So. <laughs> yeah. And he's got, I think just as good of a defense, like a defensive scheme is just as good of a, you know, defensive coach. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I don't, this is a weird this is really weird like it it looked like frank or i mean larry just watched the finals and was like i want that team i think yeah and it, they're not really set up for that and i the the thing about that too is you're you're in that case you're sort of chasing someone else's success and it's going to take you years to get there cuz the roster is not set up for that right now so what happens you, you know, in four years when you kind of have the pieces together, you know, and, and the league moves to something else. Are you, are you innovating on your own or are you just trying to copy what other people are doing and hoping it works for you too? I think it's, I think it's the latter and it's, you know, a main reason why uh, Golden State could do what they did is because they have, uh, they have Steph Curry for $11 million. Oh I mean, my like, God. Yeah. Steph Curry and DeMarcus Cousins are on the two, you know, most friendly, team-friendly contracts in the NBA. Yeah. So, I mean, that that's a big part of it. And that way you can afford to max somebody like Draymond Green. You can afford to max somebody um, like Clay Thompson and keep your core together. Um, you can afford to let a $15 million player like um, David Lee just sit on the bench and, like, rot, right? But I don't know. I mean, like, they're... <clears throat> They're going to be good. Let's last thing. No, you got to go. David West gave yeah. up yeah. Uh, thirteen million dollars to take a one point four million dollar contract uh, playing with Tim Duncan and Lamarcus Aldridge and Tony Parker and Popovich down in San Antonio. Good for him. I wish him the best of luck. He, you know, David. The one thing that sort of the 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 tie that binds with David Lee's career is that he doesn't care. You, know, David he, West. Yeah, with David West, I'm sorry. With yeah. David West, he doesn't care. Like, yeah. he, will, he will. He makes his own decisions, completely, seemingly outside of any influence from from any third party. Mm-hmm. And his, you know, in his interests might not align completely with what people traditionally think of as, you know, someone. I mean, an NBA player. Yeah. Player. I mean, this guy says he wants to win and backs it up by signing a veterans minimum contract with one of the maybe three or four teams that could win a title next year. Yeah. And he has repeatedly stated that after his NBA career, he wants to uh, 
teach high school history. Mm-hmm. He doesn't like, care. What? <laughs> yeah. No, he, do, he really doesn't care. He's not going to feed you BS. He's always been super upfront with the media. And, you know, he's, he's just, he's an open, he's, he is who he is. He shows himself to be who he is. And, you know, I think that's an admirable quality. I think the divorce from the Pacers was kind of rough. Um, I mean, he, but, he didn't like the way Larry, I mean, I think it was beyond that. Like, I think he just couldn't stand, you know, another year of cashing checks and not competing, like not being relevant. Right. Right. Um, he knows that he has like, at most three years and that's oh, yeah. really he's got two mm-hmm. and, and he doesn't want to spend it winning you know 30 games a season yep and babysitting and being you know whatever right. like whatever he is whatever he was in indiana um i've i have bought two jerseys of like current nba players like in their time cool. i bought reggie miller yep I bought two Reggie Miller jerseys, one Flo Jo and one the pinstripe. Nice. And I bought a David West jersey. I oh. bought it uh twenty like thirteen. A gold David West jersey. Like he, You're a grown man now. What are you doing where I listen town? I wear it to the games and stuff like that. Yeah. I wore it in Boston when I was good, like during the playoff games. You wear like a t shirt underneath it or do you go bare? Oh no, no, no. T shirt. Like you can't you can't pit out. Like unless you're at a like an on a beach or like uh like in swim trunk like well, anything where you're in a swim a lot lately and just really just need some validation for your effort listen man sun's out guns out like oh, i got yeah. i got I'm, i've been doing some curls man come on yeah. let me let me show it off a little bit there you go. There you go. I yeah I David West is my favorite non Reggie Pacer and it's incredible like he's the best he's got an X tattoo he's like Xavier tattoo that says my life my way oh that's like that dude yeah. that that's dude what I'm is talking about. he didn't care he does his thing <laughs> I hope they win yeah I I mean like I'm I hope you know San Antonio or Cleveland honestly I hope you know they do it um, like one of them does it or they meet in the finals that'd be amazing that'd be fun. I have a friend who hates the Spurs. I don't know how you can do that. He's, he he's a huge NBA fan, but he hates the Spurs. But I, you know, I think this. this I, I would love to see a Spurs Cleveland final, and I'd love to see Cleveland win it. And then I, yeah. the next year, yeah, for sure. And then sometime in the twenty twenties or twenty thirties, maybe the Pacers will pick up the championship. <laughs> <laughs> when the next LeBron James or Michael Jordan can come along and ruin our dreams every year. Yeah. Well. As a child, my dreams were ruined by Patrick Ewing. Oh, shout out! To, yeah, the so, thirty for thirty. Did you want you? Want, I mean, I assume you've seen the thirty for thirty. Like about a half dozen times. For now. It's my favorite movie. It's uh, it, cha- it caused my brother to change all of his passwords <laughs> to like Reggie Miller. Really, so my brother is five years true. younger than I am. Okay. So he relied on all of his Reggie Miller. Like he only saw really like the two thousand and beyond Reggie Miller. Mm. Not and he same. relied on all of these like folk stories that I would tell him from my formative days. Um, but like after seeing that movie, like I cried, like I was on spring break when that movie came out and I made everybody go back to the room and we watched it in silence and I cried. I turned it into an event. Like, <laughs> like I had all the lights off in my apartment. <laughs> I bought special food. I turned my phone off. I don't know where my wife was <laughs> and I watched it and it was the greatest. It was amazing. It, it was, was my childhood. I mean like that was my childhood. Yeah. Like that, that entire movie. It was amazing. Anyway. It was, yeah. And then they had to throw in that Larry Johnson four point play at the end. That was, that was a great 30 for 30. I mean, it was, it's one of my favorite. Like it's one of my favorite non-serious thirty for thirty. Like the you know they're the the two Escobars or whatever. Like the um, uh, I forgot that one. But like there are a bunch of like serious thirty for thirties that are really like legitimately good movies. Yeah. And this was just super fun. Like this was like a really fun like sports are just sports like documentary. I'll that tell you my favorite part of that before I before we uh, head off the air. My favorite part was surprisingly it made me like like john starks for a second because i hated john Starks. like i wanted him to fall into a pit of fire but he gets up there and he talks about his blown free throws 
And I don't know, like it humanized them to the point where I'm like, all right, I can get behind John Starks. Did this dude just did this? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. I say that all the time. I think I say that once a week. <laughs> I love that movie. I yeah. might watch that movie now. I yeah. think my girlfriend's asleep. I might like pour some whiskey and watch that movie. That's, that's, that sounds good. You know what? <laughs> Next time we're in the same town, let's just rent out a movie theater. Yes. I agree. I agree. You and I can just watch it. Oh, my God. We'd have to be in separate corners, though, because, you know there'd be action down south that I might not want to share with another person, but let's nope, I'm sitting right next to you. <laughs> <laughs> here, just you and me. Hey, last second recommendation. I saw it on my birthday. Go see um, Inside Out. Fantastic movie. Yeah. Super adult. Like, like a very That's adult. Right. That's theme. Right. Yeah. Like you, it's definitely like kids can see it and enjoy like the silliness, but like it is definitely like a, you start to question everything you've believed in your entire life. Like movie. It's awesome. It's great. I love it. Pixar is like up there with like toy story and up for me. I love that movie. Anyway. All right. I'll check it out. That, that's all I got. And thus concludes uh, the Pixar basketball. Yeah, beat. That's right. That's right. I'm Michael. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm a niche. You're a niche. All right. Thanks for listening if you made it this far. <laughs> we love Check you guys. Out Thank on you. BoiledSports.com and on iTunes. Thank you. At the Railroad Tie, at Anish Swami. Anish Swami on Twitter, on the Twitters. I've missed you, Mike. I've missed you too.